logically at 2 o'clock, especially once the lectures are finished, there's always this question about whether that, that should actually be at 2 o'clock, or because the way the university timetables works, anything after midday on a teaching day always starts at 10 past. But since we all seem to be here, um, my great pleasure to welcome Professor Dr. Dean Brewer from the Friedrich Alexander University in uh, Erlangen Nuremberg. Um, I first met here a worrying number of years ago, probably uh, at the Euroclock uh, conference where he would be talking about work to on design patterns. Uh, some very important papers about design patterns written in the mid-90s that appeared in the Oxford conference um, were written by Dirk on how you can compose multiple patterns and put them together and make larger systems. Since then, Dirk's worked on a number of things, um, among them in no particular order, an MBA from Stanford. And I think we'll hear a little bit about that on the talk tomorrow where he's looking at the use of open source business models to, to basically fund open source development or how open source can help business development. Um, he was the architect for a UML virtual machine, um, if anyone remembers what they were. Okay, nobody does. Um, he founded the first international symposium looking at the use of wikis in general. Uh, he's recently been moving that uh, conference also into directions of looking at issues of open data and then big data and how can we involve uh, more people and stakeholders in the use of kind of information systems to build it. And today again he's talking about his, I presume, empirical open source research. Again looking at this idea of open source which underpins quite a lot of these ideas and the way people work together with software which again you can see in open source and wikis and design patterns and saying now we have these repositories, now there is this open source out there. And what can we discover about how people actually build programs? So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dear. Well, thank you very much, uh, James, for this introduction, uh, which was one of the nicest and most knowledgeable introductions I think I have received in a long time. And thanks everyone for welcoming me so warmly. Um, I, I'm here because I want to present some of our work. Um, this will be a talk that is fairly broad on empirical research in the open source. I chose uh, multiple results rather than just one narrow research paper because it tends to be a bit more entertaining, it tends to get broader and uh, maybe it touches on more of the things that you're interested in. My hope is that after this talk, uh, later, today or tomorrow, if you see touch points, just walk up to me and maybe we can uh, chat. So, for my stay here, we chose two talk topics. Today, this kind of researchiest aspects of it, hardcore uh, empirical research. Tomorrow, it's about uh, open source business models. It's not your run of the mill, open how do you make money with open source. Uh, talks, uh, but rather really touches on the core business models uh, behind it. So it's much more a business uh, talk in some sense, but I'm a computer scientist, I got my PhD in computer science, uh, so I still think it's a practical and accessible talk. You don't have to be an economist uh, to, to get that. Um, the talk, talk topic we dropped, which will not be a talk, but which I'm happy to talk about uh, with anyone interested, is a new and upcoming research topic called Inner Source, where uh, companies in their internal software development processes apply uh, principles of open source software development. So a simple example is uh, what Google does with its 20% time, developers can choose how they spend some of their time in the interest of the company. So there's self-organization by way of open source practices inside companies that complements the traditional top-down project plan. That's a big topic for me. There's actually a fair amount of industry interest there as well. So that's a software engineering process topic. Um, we are also interested, or one of my PhD students is working on something called end-user programming. We call it domain expert programming because we want to empower people who do not have a traditional computer science education to be able to somehow program. Um, Excel uh, spreadsheets are a domain-specific end-user programming language because they enable people who don't have a computer science background to program. So I'm very much interested in that as well. And what we do there is we combine the idea of what wikis, this incremental, always just partially correct work uh, with programming and programming languages. 
we're interested in uh, open data and we are also interested in, um, well, surprisingly, requirements analysis, analysis and interviews. And so interview analysis now brings me, I don't want to say too much there unless that's exactly your topic, brings me to what I wanted to talk about here, which is uh, empirical, empirical work. So um, James already mentioned, uh, open source is great. It's uh, publicly developed software. So for the first time, we can broadly and deeply look into software projects. Previously, before open source, it was really hard to look at de in detail at what people were doing because companies would not let you look at their data. They would not want to do it for intellectual property reasons or the uh, workers' council hated the idea that someone was individually measuring the developers, what have you. But open source changed that because it's all publicly accessible information. So I will give you a rundown and feel free to raise your hand uh, if, there, if you have a question um, on the type of work we did here, how open source is growing, how people are programming, and what makes up the developers in open source. Um, when I say it's publicly accessible data, then all of that research, which is descriptive, descriptive uh, and model building based on data extraction we get from these projects basically has a research pipeline like this. There's the raw data out there, we extract it, we prepare it for, uh, for analysis, and we evaluate and build models for certain results which typically have a nice visual uh, presentation then. So let me know if I'm in your way. Um, we work with a particular data source called OLO. Who has heard of OLO? Okay, so most of you will know it as a service on the web, holo.net. You can go there and look up some open source project and they will show you some data on it. We actually got uh, the whole database behind it. There's much more behind the web uh, interface, a large database. These guys, uh, now owned by Black Duck Software, crawl the web. They try to download, gather all the data of all the open source projects, which has the advantage, and that's in one of our selling points in our research papers that the database they gave us um, basically is close to being representative of open source. That's a strong claim to make that what we learned about open source from analyzing all the project data from the database is representative of open source. But our data is old, uh, it's 2008, um, and we've only recently been switching to the web service which comes with less data but uh, is new. So here's a very simple first result. We just wanted to know how fast open source is growing. So some people might think open source is just a fluke, will go away. Oh, maybe, maybe not. So a very simple uh, analysis showed using this OLO database snapshot of March 2008. That's the data we have. And we looked at, um, at when projects were created, were still alive, for what time period and uh, so consequently could show a simple graph of growth and uh, a simple, um, a simple uh, model of that is actually an exponential growth curve. Um, it has a reasonable fit. If you're a mathematician, uh, you may not be happy with me saying it is exponential growth, growth. so I'm saying it's near exponential growth, uh, but um, it's pretty uh, close and basically justifies the observation that, that open source is growing rapidly. And um, first thing on your mind will be, will it continue like this? Of course not, it can't. Uh, resources in the world are limited, there's only so many software developers. So this suggests um, that open source may still be in its early stages. If we can fit an exponential model, assuming it will be an S-curve, we are still at the bottom part. Um, so open source, in terms of total number of active open source projects, um, is, uh, is growing. So before I uh, uh, jump into other results, uh, just a method, methodological note. note. Um, as you do this type, so is anyone mining software repositories? Nobody? Okay. Um, yes. Hmm? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, you know that, then you probably know that before you can get to nice results, uh, there's lots of data quality, data interpretation issues. So sometimes you have to do a fair bit of method, a methodology work before you actually get there. Here's an example. 
what on earth, so for example, we measure code and code sizes. How do you determine uh, uh, the size of a code contribution to a project, the size of a commit, for example? Let's say lines of code, maybe, but you look at this, you're only looking at historic data, and that means um, uh, you cannot distinguish if you look at a diff output, you cannot distinguish whether um, to, uh, one line uh, removed and two lines added is really just uh, one new line uh, or, and one change, etc. So you run into all kinds of uh, methodological issues. Here is one paper we did on measuring commit sizes and because that correlates with work spent on projects. We want to know how much work spent on project. And we did a study in which um, using uh, hand analysis of code show, um, um, showed us what was a code changed and what was really added and removed. And after we did this laborious work, what came out is it's basically within the statistic uh, vicinity of uh, taking half, of taking the mean of the maximum size and the minimum size. So if you get um, if you get um, uh, the maximum number of lines added plus removed, uh, that's the maximum amount of work that could have been done if the added and removed are completely separate, versus half of them are the maximum number of changed lines plus some added or removed. And you take the mean, and that is actually the best statistic guess for uh, the commit size. Um, and of course, it's a statistic measure for a large, uh, large number of commits. So for any given individual commit, uh, this is still the best guess, but of course you don't know. Uh, but we are working always with a representative sample, so look at large code bodies. So if we want to measure work being performed, this is the formal formula we use for commit sizes. We need to define other things like what on earth is an active project. So you need to come up with a definition, and the research world does not have common definitions yet. So if you read active project, uh, it may be different things in different uh, projects. Good. So um, we looked at uh, the total growth and uh, the first derivative, the code added over time. Since it's an exponential, it's also exponential, uh, no surprise here. And um, so, yes, it is close to exponential growth. Why do we uh, then uh, care about open source? So, okay. So why, let me motivate before I get to more details results, why it's so thrilling and interesting to look at uh, open source projects. You might say, oh, there's no money in it. Well, I'll show you differently tomorrow. But um, here on this graph, you see one of the most interesting insights, in my opinion, that motivates open source, uh, empirical open source research. You see, uh, basically, the size of a project in terms of the number of people recognized as committers, so the core developers of a project, versus how many of those uh, uh, projects are there. And then each line is a year line. So this is 1995. There were, uh, there were 10 projects in our sample, in our database, 10 projects of size one developer. So 10 smallest projects with one developer. And, but, but that year there were already like maybe four projects of size 10 developers. And then you need to look at the growth over the years. And you can see how these are the year lines, how they grow out. And you can see the last data we have is 2008. There were in that database we have. So again, that's a subset of all of open source, about 30% of active projects. We had 4,000 smallest projects, 4,000 one-person projects, but at the same time we had about 10 projects of a, of a size 1,000 developers. So these are all active projects and open source has grown over time to the largest project sizes. And uh, we can measure that empirically. Uh, nobody can claim that this is not the case because we can see it in the data. So you talk to agile methods of people, right? that will say, of course we can scale to large project sizes, but today, at least that's my uh, take on the literature, you still have to believe a consultant that they can tell you how to reliably scale to large project sizes. But they will have a theory of how they do it. In open source, we observe that it's, it's happening, but we don't know quite yet why. 
uh, but we see it's happening. And so uh, I find this completely thrilling to see how um, we reach these, reach these large project sizes and there's no overarching theory of how open source software development works. And then you look at it and you see, oh, everyone's different. So the Linux kernel is being developed quite differently from the Eclipse platform. And what that implies is, because in open source there is no textbook definition of how to do it. It's a continued, ongoing experiment in software development methods. It's basically open source, in my opinion, for us, is exploring the search space of possible research processes, possible software development processes. Because nobody's, nobody's <coughs> taking that. It's a lot of individuals making the individual decisions with lots of idiosyncrasies. Um, and many, of course, have had lots of hindsight bias, many projects will fail, but many will succeed at very crummy software development processes, one might think, but they still seem to work. So it's opening up the space. Um, you don't get experiments like this inside companies because uh, they will always fear that the project won't work, and of course they have money to lose, so they won't do it. But in open source, it's the people and their ideas. All right. Um, so that's why I'm so excited and why there's so much new things coming out of analyzing open source. Here's a simple result when we looked at licenses. We are doing all kinds of open source development from a practical perspective. First question people ask, like, I want to do an open source project, what license should I choose? Well, uh, which license to choose is a philosophical decision, but we can look at how, it be, how it things work out over time. So uh, we can see um, in this, again, this, uh, uh, we can, yeah, so it's uh, already a its log scale. We can see the exponential growth here. Uh, we can see how we build our projects into those with a restrictive, meaning a GPL type of license, and those with a permissive license. And both, or not, both, both bins are more or less uh, um, exponential growth. But, fairly clearly recognizable, there is some point in the middle, uh, around 2000, where there is a change in, um, in, um, in the growth, it's a bit slower there. Um, and also, uh, we don't quite see it here, but the math will spell it out, that restrictive licenses were growing faster until around 2000, 2001. And after that, permissive licenses were growing faster. So that dent actually meant uh, restrictive uh, was slowing down. We can model it, so if we make it a two-period uh, function and basically have a gap here uh, rather than just a smooth uh, uh, curricle curve and um, have a, like, a formula like this here. Uh, again, exponential, but uh, split up into two periods. And uh, this is the estimated point of time where there's this change and uh, close to each other uh, in the model um, when the um, growth uh, rate changed and we can see that after that uh, we can almost see in the um, formulas that uh, permissive were growing faster than uh, restrictive licenses after 2000. Not substantially, this is not like uh, a GPL or anything, it's out of business, quite the opposite, but there was a change and the most common interpretation is that the increased influx of commercial development into open source simply uh, helped permissive licenses uh, go faster. Okay, so here changing, changing direction. Um, this is a very different result. Um, you can, should have remembered that this was the next slide because I like to ask. So what do you think as you're programming? How many sublines of code if you make a commit? a code repository, you just finished a feature or something, what's the most frequent commit size that, uh, that your commit has? I did a lot of maintenance programming, four mm -hmm. lines. Mm -hmm. Four lines, okay. Other opinions? Yeah. Three lines. Three lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alright. Two lines, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, very well informed uh, 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 experts. Um, People typically tell me 30 lines, sometimes get 100 lines of code. Uh, that's probably biased by, or oh, if I'm programming, I want to do something real, and that's a whole feature of bug fix. 
The reality is uh, one-liners are the most frequent ones, the second two-liners are the second most frequent one, etc. I have to add this within some statistical limits. So maybe it's two lines and one lines is uh, the second most frequent. And here you see an artifact where we have these 0.5 and 0, which is because of after the fact determining commit sizes is hard. We don't know, so we use that formula you saw earlier. So it's a strictly falling um, uh, power law following a curve where it shows that open source is truly incremental development. Actually, we'll see in a second like closed source of development too. Um, so you can model that, and we actually model that um, as well. So we have a nice uh, Pareto distribution for that. Um, you see the cumulative probability, and so say. Uh, 80% is at, at 100 lines of code. So 80% um, of all commits are 100 lines of code or less. Um, so the surprising thing is one-liners are really small commits, so the most frequent ones. And the other surprising thing is there are lots of really large commits. So one thing you actually do when mining repositories is you try to take out outliers, anything that ruins the data but doesn't add to the analysis. Um, so yes, we took out things like the can be when someone committed a whole library, just copied the library and put it into the code so that this didn't uh, work the results. Um, after that, still, there's still huge commits that people do. So um, they may not be very common, but they clearly are there. So they are part of uh, regular programming. Um, so um, one thing we did, so you may wonder at some point of time, so interesting, but who cares? Um, so before I get to that, um, let me just... Can you click away from that next time it comes up and see if you can hide it rather than cancelling it? Okay, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's just a reflex, I forget it. Um, so we thought, well, what do people actually think? So we did a survey and asked software developers, what's your guess? What's the, what's the uh, um, mode of the, what's the most frequent uh, commit size? And so we did a, a, a survey on that. And um, the result was uh, that uh, people, um, okay, so for open source, actually came close to a power law, but when we looked at what they thought was the most frequent commit size, etc., it's, uh, like, it's 10 lines of code. So actually that was surprisingly good, given that, if I ask an audience, like 30 or 50 lines of code, but they're still off. Um, I spare you that, but the point is we asked, um, we asked uh, open source developers, we asked closed source developers, and we asked people who develop development tools. And the development, the developers of software development tools were equally far off like those who are just develop business applications. So if there's a conclusion here, then it is that those who develop our tools may not be aware of these empirical uh, information. Um, I would, think, would assume they are, like you studying maintenance, um, would have, would have, of course, measured what's the reality, um, but it did not show in our survey. And so, for, and that, for example, motivates, right here, no, motivates uh, this particular research. We looked at the size of code contributions. We actually looked at the frequency of code contributions. So, what's the estimated time of arrival of the next commit to a code configuration management system, so that we can model. Uh, how the client of, say, a configuration management system um, behaves so that you can better design a configuration management system or a better provision if you're uh, supporting a software development organization. Um, that is the general immediate motivation for doing such empirical work. You want to understand, you want to model so that you can build tools better, that you can improve your methods and processes. Um, here a small result. Um, people always claim that open source is cowboy coding, not well documented. Um, this is a very rough result um, because it's a result, again, over the whole database, implying about 
all the Java projects and Python and Perl and C and what have you. So it's mixing all of that into the same bucket. It's a bit problematic, so bear with me. What we measured is the amount, the so-called so comment density. How many lines of comments uh, are there in our useful code? And the result is close to 20%. So every fifth line, uh, on average, is, uh, is a comment in open source. We analyzed a bit more deeply, it's not shown here. Java is actually at 27% comment line, while Perl was at 11, comment density, while Perl was at 11. Um, but what we could not do is analyze those comments. So Java, for example, will have lots of boilerplate uh, comments from, uh, that your IDE generates for you. So it, it's semi-useful, but clearly it's interesting to observe that open source is not a new comment. Clearly, uh, trying to comment its own. Um, okay, so actually, I, I um, so I actually mentioned this already. We did some work on web commits come into a configuration management system, and so the median time is uh, 100 minutes, and um, mean is uh, the mean is quite far away from the median. That's because people go on vacation. Don't know, you can't see it in the configuration management system if someone's going on vacation, that's why we're using the median here. But every hundred minutes there is a comment at the median. Any reaction to that? That means like five, six comments a day, perhaps. So I know people who um, work for a week, it's Friday, they go home, now they check in, and then they go home. And of course it's Friday and nobody can reach them if the code breaks, but so um, it's open source is fairly continued regular uh, work. Um, what we don't see behind that data is yes, you only see the committers' data, um, but uh, they may be integrating other people's work. So yes, uh, there are possibly multiple people, but it's very steady uh, development. Okay, Let's speed up here a little bit. So we did some initial comparison between open source and uh, closed source. That's difficult because there's nothing in closed source where we could claim to be representative. So you may argue all closed source projects are different. Um, but here we found, this is the commit size, we found that um, a set of very young um, open closed source projects um, at SAP, my employer back then, uh, were actually developed in a much coarse grain way. So there's a recognizable difference between uh, the green uh, graph, which is closed source projects within that first 18 months, um, and they have much larger uh, commits uh, than open source with, but now they're both, um, they're both um, small and uh, were both um, young and mature projects are kind of incrementally being developed. Um, but, um, I don't show it you, uh, but still, it's, um, we would find, I don't show it here, that the most common, uh, the most frequent commit size in closed source also are lines of code. So it's actually um, quite similar. All right, so um, changing gears once more. Uh, here is the day of, uh, of so the work week of Linux uh, authors, where authors are people who develop code. So it's not the maintainers, or it's a role. So it could be a maintainer as well, but it's a person writing code. It's not about integrating code. And uh, so we looked at the Linux kernel Git, which is uh, very nice because it's got high quality data. And so we could see when people are in what time zone, made uh, or made a commit. And you can see, what do you see? It's, uh, okay, so every line is one day, so you can see the work, the days of the week. And you can see, if you ask me, it's pretty regular uh, work week, where work days where people do sleep at night, they go for lunch, and they certainly stop working later. Maybe a surprising thing is work that picks up after dinner. Uh, my conclusion is, uh, open source software developers are regular people. They have a, um, have a reasonable, regular work pattern, work behavior like every other software developer, and probably like every other human. 
Um, of course, I have more interest in things where maybe it's different, except uh, beyond being just like the rest of us uh, most of the time. So, for example, the work on the weekend and the work picking up uh, after after uh, dinner. So, what you don't see in here is different bins of developers. Uh, so, there are people who develop Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 only. There are people who develop in during spare time only. And there's a substantial number of people who develop uh, code all the time. So, whether it's paid work or it's the spare time work, um, uh, they are always at it. Uh, here, a bit more detail. Um, the smooth curves is the OLO data, so something close to being representative of open source, and the not so smooth data is just the Linux curve. So, you can see um, here uh, over a day. Uh, the number of commits kernel. And it's pretty much like the Linux kernel and uh, smooth out. And we can see that it's the, uh, that the labels should have been adjusted. Um, no, so, so here's the number of commits and here's the commit sizes. So it's basically correlates. So the commit itself and then how big it is uh, doesn't make a difference. So uh, we don't need to do both graphs with. Really. Okay, so we were, well, why did we do this type of work? Um, so tomorrow you'll see some additional data, but uh, the question always is, well, how commercial is open source software development? Is it all like hippies in their spare time and something bad happens and open source goes away? Uh, no such thing. Um, you'll find that, uh, that open source is solidly commercial, is, is, has a strong commercial backing, and I actually think I should have the data here. Um, where, uh, well, let me. Okay, so, um, yes, so open source is uh, solidly commercial along the lines that a substantial number um, of people develop open source software during the work hours. So we look at the time, normalized across the time zones, and we find that about 50% for the Linux kernel, as well as for the OLO projects, this large sample, 50% of these commits were made during a work on a work day between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. So when most people get paid uh, to do their job. Half of open source, I think as a fair conclusion, is paid for uh, work. Uh, which leaves 50%, which is still volunteer work. Um, uh, but still, uh, that means that uh, there's a substantial commercial backing. Uh, we were then interested in, uh, of those developers, how many are enthusiasts along the lines that they do it during spare times, and how many are I'm uh, just being paid Monday, Friday, 9 to 5, that's it, after 5 and out of here, which is that large peak at the end. Here, the number on the y-axis, uh, 10,000 in our older sample, um, are those developers who make all work they did uh, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. So only where they were being paid. And they went home and they just were done with the work there. And so I you see it in terms of percentages uh, here. Uh, those developers on the Linux kernel who work Monday, Friday, 9 to 5, and only Monday, Friday, 9 to 5. That's about 23% of the uh, Linux kernel developer, and uh, in OLO, uh, the OLO projects, it's 17, 56%. And also, how many people are there who really only do it during spare time? So there's a substantial uh, outside Monday, Friday, 9 to 5 uh, subset of people uh, doing it, and then there are plenty those in the middle may be the most interesting one, ones because they are paid, obviously. Um, or some of them are paid, you can see this more here. So the closer to here, the more you're being paid. Um, but they also are so happy and interested, they keep working either after hours, maybe that is still their work day because uh, that's how they work, or maybe they because they are enthusiasts. So the follow-on research, which we have yet to do, is of course 
to look at how this data informs us about a project mortality or um, survival of projects in what's a good rate between uh, developers in a project that are volunteers do it on their own versus are being paid for. And as we look at individual projects, we always see it's a certain mixture. It's a distribution. But what is the right distribution? What should you be aiming for? And um, turn around as a development manager at some company, as you look at some open source components, should you use it in your project? Is that a healthy project? You always want to know, is that a healthy open source project if you uh, base your own products on it? And we believe that this participation, this mixed participation between commercial and volunteer work is uh, as a good indicator. All right. Okay, that's it. Um, I made it well in time, hoping for some question. Much of this is published, but of course we are doing more, and maybe you have ideas. Maybe there are, well, questions, I'm guessing. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> when you showed the data of how different commits are in different times of the day, how you uh, keep in consideration the different uh, time zone where the different developer can be mm -hmm. and how this influence project like mm -hmm. and your So um, the question is uh, people work all around the world so they are in different time zones why uh, um, why uh, this may not show in a configuration management system Yeah, so. do you take people to see where it is? Yes, so Git actually has very good data, so you can see the time zone. Um, the OLO data did not, uh, so we did run into this problem that we would have a time, but we didn't know uh, what time zone because it was just uh, UTC. What we did is we had a, a good sample, a subset where we knew what time zone things were in, and so we created a norm week from that, and then we shifted those for which we didn't know it around until we had the best squares fit uh, with that normal week. So there is some some uh, some uncertainty, but we don't believe it's a big uncertainty around. Okay. You are you are fundamentally assuming that people work nine to five um, in full time employment. Or no? Well, so is we have to make it assumption. So um, actually, so we needed. So we want to make a claim. So we say like it's paid work. So how do you define paid work? So we looked at what it could be, and we find that in Western countries it's Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 is the most common definition of uh, work time. We could have used something else. No, because, you know, if people are working in an office where they have to get those out, but a lot of people working on contracts yeah. simply work their own hours when, they, you know, when it suits them. I, I think it's a very uh, good comment. Um, what it means to me is that we may well be underestimating the amount of commercial work. So if you're a contractor and you work on the weekend or your family situation requires you work late at night or something, uh, we would consider it volunteer work and may have classified it inappropriately and incorrectly. Yeah. Sorry, I think that means you make a overestimate the amount of paid work. Because I think a lot of people might work shifts and then in their spare time might be nine to five. I mean, it's, it's, it's software development. Yeah. Okay. Um, we didn't think about that specifically. Um, so, say the paper we write just said work time as defined like this. So we are uh, um, that, that's how we define it. Uh, I, I wasn't actually aware that there's a huge amount of shift work and, and, and software development. I mean, people that are working shift work in another career, perhaps, and yeah. doing this kind of software development for mm -hmm. their time, which could be then during the hours of nine to five. Okay. Or people that work part time, nine to five, in a paid job, and then go home and do some open source development, but still falls into the nine to five bracket. Okay. Yeah. Having worked in the field for a long time, um, several of the places I worked as on, uh, on salary, and it wasn't nine to five. It wasn't forty hours a week. It mm -hmm. was however long it took. Okay. And so mm -hmm. the the. Um, situation of, of seeming to be working both as paid and mm -hmm. for free isn't valid. It's it's all stuff that I was paid for mm -hmm. 
where the expectation was I would do what was needed. Oh, regardless of yeah. <coughs> Very interesting to get these comments. I mean, I agree. I see uh, along the lines of there is all this variation of when people do work. I just did not assume that it would be a substantial percentage. So I would have to say it's a hypothesis right now and we don't know. Maybe we should look into it and, uh, and uh, adjust it based on that. But I don't even know whether it's possible to figure out uh, whether how, how to change the work time definition from Monday, Friday, 9 to 5. Um, I think the fact that there's a rather large dip in the lunch hour is definitely a point in favour of it being code done at work because if it was shift workers working on it in their spare time they wouldn't necessarily take their lunch break at 12 to 1 religiously every day. Thank you. When you look at project mortality I suggest that you look at developer recruitment. I attempted to join myself to an open source project and I needed to make a one line change for it to build in my world and they told me my world was invalid and rejected the change. Oh, yeah. So that is interesting research how you can actually join a project and um, because uh, in particular the projects are commercially relevant, they will have lots of people streaming coming to it because it has, uh, uh, this is other work we didn't do, other people did it has key economic benefits actually. Um, mm -hmm. So that is project immigration, that this is actually a hot research topic. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Yeah, just to take you away from the gnarly to topic of who's paid for what. Um, you've got the research on the uh, number of projects. Do you have uh, research on the uptake of open source software? Uh, so we had the initial work on the overall exponential growth by the number of active projects under development and that clearly showed a strong uptake near exponential basically. Uh, is that what you asked? No, you, so, so what you have there is the, is the number of projects. Yeah. The question really relates to how uh, open source software is used. Uh -huh. so, what the, so for example, um, Seven years ago, Google was used at 5,000 sites that we knew around the world. Now it's hundreds of thousands of sites that we know of. So that, I just wonder if there's a. Yeah, we don't have any that. data like this. I'm not sure anyone else really has. It would be very interesting. You look at your average startup, they just take a huge open source stack and do their 5% code of the total, maybe uh, as some web service on top of it. And so. The use of open sources is uh, certainly um, uh, large. Um, how it's changing or where it is right now, I don't know. I already know that Windows uh, contains open source code, which is always good uh, to know. I remember some surveys which showed that open source products, 80% uh, of all open source products today, uh, clearly have open source code in them. But, um, so maybe you can extrapolate from that. Um, are you interested in looking at trying to classify the commits mm -hmm. into different kinds, like refactoring, mm -hmm. adding features, bug fixes, that kind of thing? Is that something you might have a go at? Um, we are not working on that right now. So this, these are individual results we got over time. Uh, our focus right now is um, open source, uh, what you can learn from open source and software architectures. So certain metrics uh, that you can find an open source, that you can calculate now that you have open source projects on a large scale, you can calculate them and predict, um, or try to predict survival <coughs> of projects. Um, open source versus closed source with respect to security and vulnerabilities introduced into the code. Um, and also a more tech, uh, not a technical, but a, um, a method problem, which is all of these queries underlined, so all of these graphs <coughs> actually were based on lots of data analysis and the queries run for weeks sometimes if you get them wrong. So we also, I also have a PhD student working on making that querying uh, much faster. So it requires new arrangement of the data and all that because it's slow. I mean, it's just incredibly slow and you have this hypothesis or that hypothesis and you want to add that parameter and how is it in that programming language in projects of that category, etc., etc., from this time zone. Um, every time you have to wait for a couple of hours or longer if you just change one parameter, so we're changing uh, doing some work to make that faster. 
Um, from the point of view of growing on the open source in general, as you showed in the first part of the talk, the world software developing is growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. So, have you any way to make a guess on how open source is growing with respect to the normalized mm -hmm. over the growth of software in general? So, I don't think oh, software in general is growing exponentially. I would be surprised. Um, do we have any data? No, I have no data, just my intuition. No, no I, I think it more or less correlates with the number of developers out there. So to the extent that universities uh, can create more programmers, we may have growth in, in uh, code or written. Um, so I think open source has been eating into closed source uh, quite, quite heavily. Um, we have a hunch now that we may actually be at the um, uh, switch over point in an S curve, I don't know the English term, but that we might actually have reached that term where uh, we will slow down again. But uh, the curve is actually more like the question is, is this usable or will the curve explode now? So the point is, if open source has been going like this, I think we may be here and we're going like this now, and this may be over growth. So the really interesting question is if this is 100%, and this is close and below here is open. Is this like 5% or 20% or is it 70% <coughs> of all being open source versus closed source? So we don't know. Uh, we hope to make that projection at some future point of time, but it requires much more work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, restricted versus permissive. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me some examples of restricted? Oh, okay, um, so I'm, I'm sorry, um, I didn't do that properly. BSD um, and uh, MIT licenses are permissive and uh, the copy left is restrictive. Yes, so uh, that's a straight answer um, um, in terms of GPL, AGPL, as you said, they are restrictive or reciprocal licenses, the so-called minor licenses, and the permissive are BSD. Um, Put Apache, etc. There, what the, what it means is that the restrictive license, if you change the code and pass on uh, a product based on that code, you have to also pass on your source code changes. While in a permissive way, you can take a library, modify it for your needs, and you don't have to open source that library as you uh, as you create a product and sell a product based on. It. So. Um, in a way, a permissive license is more commerce friendly because a company can use it, uh, modify it, and sell a product based on it without having to open source their changes to a library. Um, yeah. So, I think, yeah. so you, if I understood correctly, you, you said you don't believe the number of developers is growing exponentially. Is that right? Yeah. But surely. I would have thought with developing countries, particularly China and India, coming more and more online, that the number of developers would be growing exponentially. I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, it's, um, I, I know that Chinese universities are of course churning out developers like everyone else. I think they're growing the system. I might be surprised if this is anywhere near exponential. But I don't know. But I do not know a nice uh, result uh, coming out of um, this work here. Um, work on the world open source, knowing the time zones, um, work in the world open source is being developed. And um, it's very clear Europe is, um, is uh, leading uh, the US, actually the East Coast is uh, second. And surprisingly, we got not much contributions uh, from what can only identify as Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> it's completely flat, uh, almost flat in, in uh, what from the time zone from points to China. So that's actually a very interesting research question to me. Uh, it's unfair a bit in China these days. Uh, what the cultural underpinnings are that open source does not fly that. So I actually talked to I talked to a lobbyist recently, the Chinese government is trying to pour money into open source software development. And nobody's taking it. So the companies, Chinese state-owned enterprises, private enterprises, private, happy to take money usually, just don't. 
uh, if they don't get it or they don't want to or they can't make it match the business models. Uh, just to follow on from that, uh, one of your first graphs was showing the growth in metas over time since way back. Have you thought of doing that per country or time zone as well to see which countries? No, we haven't done that yet. So it's exactly this problem of you look at a question and you'd be really interested if you vary this one parameter, like by time zone or yeah. by uh, nationality, uh, lang programming language or size of a project or maturity of a project. Um, and it's uh, right now very hard to do this type of analytics actually. Because it could be interesting to see. So Mm -hmm. Some countries might be in the middle of the S curve and some might exactly. be just so, so I, I, I get totally excited about all the hypotheses you can yeah. have, but then it gets dampened down by having to wait 48 hours until you know. <laughs> if you can know, if you can know. <laughs> if it's in the data. Much of the stuff, of course, is not yet in the data um, that we have. At least. Uh, the S curve is a logistic distribution in English. Mm -hmm. And there was a seminar I didn't go to on finding relationships that are too weak to find with standard regression that somebody who did go should catch you up on in case it changes the shape of your expensive search problem. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for the hint. Uh, it occurred to us that our math skills are reaching their limits actually and I learned that when I got a theoretical a physicist to help us to look at that's why I was kind of at the early slides on the exponential curve, kind of getting a shellacking from him. Did you say shellacking? Uh, kind of eating for some of the math we did there. Uh, so we have lots of our stuff uh, like really, really uh, trimmed and corrected. It's, it's usually not a big change in the result, but the math uh, can be very tricky. And so, yes, uh, he's exactly working on that kind of math. So thanks for the point. When the transition occurred mm -hmm. in, in their relative uptakes of the two types of licenses, mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, some comment in the trade journals, trade press, mm -hmm. about how um, uh, the restrictive licenses were fading away. Um, mm -hmm. My hypothesis has been that um, no, that the, res that the restrictive licenses are continuing as strong as ever. It's just that the permissive licenses are eating more of the uh, commercial of the of the um, closed licenses. So, so I believe I know which uh, trade press article you're referring to by actually uh, what was the four five one group, and they actually analyze um, uh, data that followed right after. So they Funnily enough, started around 2008 or so. They had newer data, but they found the same results, except that they only graphed it. And so they didn't do any modeling, so they don't have any close form mathematical equations behind it. Um, and just use it like this, or it's fading away. So I looked at it, I thought it's nice for a tra trade press article, but uh, any speculation like uh, restrictive is going away is not justified by the data. It's well, just the, the, the alternative hypothesis is that this is an artifact of the destruction of uh, closed licenses, of uh, that the closed software is collapsing, and yeah. as people um, are uh, abandoning their closed licenses, they are going to a permissive. Uh, open license in hopes of preserving um, failed commercial models. Yep. So I, I clearly agree on on more and more um, open source projects. Um, if you um, for a while in 2002, three to 2006, seven, eight, Silicon Valley venture capitalists were explicitly trying to create open source commercial open source startups because they realized as a business model it's superior uh, to traditional closed source shops so this was being pushed and so yes slowly I would agree closed source is pushed out of the market uh, but it will be a long time so something like my former employer SAP you can't easily take that out and they will be happily uh, out there for a long time so I, I'm not sure that that uh, really closed source uh, existing closed source is strongly pushed away 
Uh, there are some markets where there never was a lot of money or where it was always very hard to make money like software development tools. So yes, uh, things like the Eclipse platform have flattened the, uh, the Java tools market basically. But um, that is only a subset. So you look at business software, it's alive and kicking and I don't think that, that open source um, has... Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a hypothesis. What do you mean by long time? Mm -hmm. Because you know, in different contexts can be yeah, very different. Long time, sorry, we watch context that I just yeah. said. Some second ago you say uh, maybe for the software, but it will be a oh. long, long time. Well, okay, good point. Um, 120. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm, this is getting philosophical, I think. Um, it actually typically needs a paradigm shift, right? So SAP can. Uh, keep running the world's uh, business software for a long time, but comes a paradigm shift like uh, to cloud services, it might happen faster and sooner. So, uh, at the time that we are experiencing paradigm shifts that give new new companies and new strategies and new handle, uh, 10 years, otherwise it could easily be 15, 20 years. SAP stock price, surprising to me, keeps going up. Yeah. Uh, so Git allows you to differentiate between the code committer and the um, yes. the contrib well, the person who writes the software and the person mm -hmm. who, who commits it. Yep. I wonder if um, you have any thoughts on the uh, like. My impression is the larger the project, the more people you need to simply coordinate the patches. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's any data on that. Or... Uh, I would actually have assumed it's a stable relationship. Yes, the project grows. Um, and the contributor to committer ratio may change, but there must, but it can't be substantial changes. So I don't know, one, one maintainer and then also one committer for 10 to 30 contributors, perhaps. Um, but I don't know, we didn't look at that yet. Actually, that would be a fairly easy thing to find out. Also, I should use that in my research class as a term project. <laughs> a very good idea, thank you. But I don't know the answer to it. Um, I was wondering if the, uh, when, when, you, when you look at this graph of the uh, number of uh, uh, committers and the number of lines committed, uh, are you able in, uh, to distinguish in, the, in that research um, if, um, uh, if uh, on a project uh, has a larger number, number of lines, so uh, it's mainly to distinguish projects, uh, the life cycle of the project? Because uh, there might be a number of lines committed, but uh, it might be just pure maintenance work, which will mean that uh, yeah. there's a num number of projects which are in very late stage. And uh, they are adding to the uh, total pool of uh, committed yeah. lines. So, um, much of our research suffers from, has a strength of being representative, because my research group has this large sample that most, that nobody else has. At the same time, uh, we make these sweeping statements. Yes, it's true in aggregate, but we don't look at such details like was this uh, a perfective or what type of commit was it, right? So, um, uh, was it just maintenance uh, or was it new features being developed? It was it uh, at a young stage or at an old stage of project? And so, we want to make these distinctions and I think uh, with some of the work that I mentioned earlier that we're trying to do, we will find it much easier to make this so that literally I hope to be able to stand here and you ask me, oh, how is this changing for old projects and if it was only Java projects, etc. And now I didn't answer your question, I know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, because the, the reason why I was asking is that um, if you will know um, uh, the percentage of the projects which are in early life stage, uh, this, so this might actually tell us or answer the, the question about the, the, the curve, the shape of the curve, uh, which you shown up there. Uh, because if there will be a growing number of uh, early life stage projects, uh, that, that means that uh, we are uh, still keeping the exponential growth for a longer time. Yeah. Um, yes, so any additional up here is a new project that was born at that point of time. Uh, so the, uh, if you have an increase here, there must be a new project that was born at this point of time and kept going for, for that. Alright. James said that uh, 
uh, three or three o'clock is something I should aim for. If someone wants to leave right now, but I'd be very happy uh, to keep discussing things. So um, let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you.